Heavenly Father, again, thank you for an amazing day. We pray, Lord, as we look into your word and hear from your word, uh, God, that our hearts and our minds would be receptive, that we would find hope and expectation and promise uh, in your promise for the home that you're building for us in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is a big travel weekend, of course, for everybody, except for you all. Y'all are staying here. Anyone going anywhere after this? No? Staying in town? Apparently, like, the amount of travel going on this weekend is, like, higher than 2019, higher than post-pandemic. So everyone obviously has been saving up, still getting out of town and, and burning oil to, to get there. So amazing destination. Zong was telling me that some of the kids that she teaches um, weren't in school yesterday, weren't in school the day before. Any guys missing classmates <laughs> this week? because of uh, getting out and into the great destinations. Um, so everyone's looking forward to getting a jump on summer, of course. You got tents and barbecue and water parks and beaches and mountains to climb and vistas to take pictures of. It's, uh, of course, unofficial start to summer. But the greatest destination, of course, that we can ever hope to go to is not on earth it's in heaven um, obviously we've been hearing a lot about heaven from me and pastor Ben and other pastors over the last couple months because of all the funerals and you might be wondering why is Chris talking about heaven again and it just dawned on me this that we don't talk about it enough honestly and if we only reserve talking about heaven for funerals then it becomes kind of a sad topic and heaven is not a sad topic at all in fact it's the most hopeful and exciting topic that you can ever ever discuss so i will be mentioning a few things that you probably heard in the last couple months if you were listening to me i uh, hope you didn't zone out but if you did hey it'll be new for you but i would like to go even deeper and this should be something that we really have a good grasp on as believers um so uh when we think about trips and going places, none of you will plan will will go to a destination without planning for it and anticipating it. No no dad here, no mom here is gonna hop in the car, you know, with a suitcase full of stuff. The kids say, Hey, where are we going? And you say, I have no clue. Right? Nobody does that. You know where you're going, you've researched it, you anticipate it, you're looking forward to it, you've prepared, you have a destination, you have directions. You have the brochure, you have expectations. And so we have, we ought to have the same for heaven. So again, this is why we're talking about it. We need to have, be prepared and know as much as possible before we go. So before we talk about heaven, you of course need to understand why it's so incredible that we get to go there. It's because we don't deserve to go there. The Bible is very clear that heaven is the place where God resides. It is, um, it is a place of perfection. And because of that, because we're sinful, we don't deserve to go. God uh, hates sin. He, uh, the punishment for sin is death. And the, the, the eternal punishment for sin is hell. Uh, thankfully, as we know, God sent Jesus Christ on the cross to die for us, die for our sins, to save us from our, our sins and save us from an eternal separation from God in hell. So even though hell is what we deserve, I, I remember hearing that one time in college from a friend and it, me being like, no, I don't think so. And I haven't been a Christian for my whole life. And I'm like, no, Christian, it's, it's uncomfortable to say that, that hell is what we deserve, but that's exactly what we deserve. It was not built for us, it was not made for us, but uh, it is the place of final rejection of God to say, God, I really don't want you. God, at, at the point of death, God will say, okay, the, the only place in the universe I can send you is the, for a place that you want, don't want me, is that place. So it is a place that we deserve, but because of Jesus Christ, he made a way for us, and the debt is paid when he, he, paid, he died on the cross for our sins. Um, and we know the rest of the story. He resurrected on the third day, he rose again, he rose to heaven, he sits at the right hand of God. And when we trust in him, we have that promise the simple gospel message that we are heaven bound when we put our faith in Christ 
Um, you're like Chris. You say that many times. I know that story already. Why do you need to? Why do you need to hear it again? Because we need it for our own hearts, and we need to rem remind it for our own children. And we need to remind ourselves the simple gospel message over and over again, so that we have clarity in how we speak it to others. So that's why I keep mentioning it over and over again. Um, heaven, of course, is more than we deserve, but because of Jesus, it is still our final destination. Um, I want you to think of heaven as a waiting room. So you go to the airport, and what do you do? You're two hours early, you run, run in through the front door, the first thing you do is you go through security, right? And thankfully, maybe this time it's fast security, and you run to your gate, and what do you do at that point in, point in time? You sit, right? You sit maybe for an hour or more, depending how early you got there. But when any, anyone goes on a trip, nobody talks about the waiting room. Nobody says, hey, the airport was amazing. It might have been an amazing airport and clean and wonderful. The airport is not the point. And the same thing here. And our, as much as we talk about living a great life here, and the Bible talks about um, living you know, uh, godly lives and doing wonderful, and these are, these are important things, heaven and our eternity in heaven is going to be far, far longer than any blip that we have called a life here on earth and so the point is the destination we don't and we should and I hope we all have a great experience at the quote unquote airport but the waiting room is not the point the destination is the point because uh, the, the fun starts and you bust out the swimming suit and you run to get in line and you start climbing those mountains right that's the point and that's what heaven is so most of the time uh, when we talk about heaven we talk about what's not there, right? We say, well, there's no more suffering and there's no more disease and there's no more war. And those are great things, right? And we should talk about those things and it's encouraging. However, we don't talk about heaven, like just to talk about what's not there is not really the point. We should talk about what is there. So we'll t spend the rest of our time talking about that. Um, if you're mentally taking notes, because I see no pen, that's fine. But, uh, <laughs> The first point is simply this, right? That the first thing we need to look forward to is that we will live in resurrected bodies. Resurrected bodies. Now, all cultures believe that the spirit leaves the body. Uh, all religions, all belief systems have some idea of or explanation of the spirit leaving the body, right? But Christianity is the only religion, the only belief system that believes in a resurrected body. Um, Christianity, of course, says that we also, just as Christ was resurrected, so we will be resurrected in body. Now, of course, uh, uh, we see this because of Jesus. He stood before his disciples in Luke chapter 24. He says, uh, look at my hands and look at my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see, uh, as you can see that I have. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 then speaks to us. It says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, uh, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, meaning our bodies will be re-raised, re, re resurrected, and we will be changed. So when God prepares a new body for us, that is the first thing to look forward to. Um, question. Why does God want a body for us in eternity? Couldn't he just be like, hey, just live as a spirit in eternity? And that would be pretty cool, right? So why the body? And here's what I think. The body is built for sensory experience and pleasure in the new earth. Sensory experience and pleasure in the new earth. So a body can see. We look around and we see trees and grass and uh, sky and clouds and uh, that's something that brings us joy and peace and when we, we look around those things, uh, we see these things, um, we, can, we can experience them, we touch them, we smell the flowers, we pick the fruit, we taste it and God said that the body, uh, made the body to experience and enjoy physical things. When God made the body, right? There's a, there's actually a, a heretical, um, 
group out there that says that the body uh, is evil, is sinful, and that we need to uh, decrease the importance of the flesh and the body and increase the importance of the spirit. But the fact that God made the body and said it was very good. When God made Adam and Eve, he said, <laughs> right? Very good. This is you made all creation, made the sky, so it's good, 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 good. Everything he made is good. And he made humanity. And he said it's very good. They're made in the image of God. So in today's uh, uh, and the, the physical body, by the way, is not something that we should be ashamed of. I feel like today, like our there's an entire billion dollar industry built on shame built on humans feeling like they're not good enough it's called the makeup industry right they capitalize on your nervousness and anxiety about how you believe about your own body there's there's a billion dollar industry capitalizing on on our shame about how we look and how we feel about ourselves why do we need to be told to love ourselves why do our young girls and young boys need to be taught love? Why, why isn't that natural? It's because when Adam and Eve fell, shame came. And shame then came upon not just our relationship with uh, each other, our relationship with God, but our relationship with ourselves and our bodies. But in the new earth, in the new heaven, we will have no shame in our bodies. Um, in Romans 8, 21, it says, Creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of decay. Listen to that phrase, the bondage of decay. That's true, right? We can't escape this bondage of our bodies failing us. Ken was just saying, wow, Pastor Chris, your legs are really ugly. <laughs> they are. I can't. Now everyone's looking at my legs. But, <laughs> but I'm kind of at that age where I bruise easily and I heal slowly. So yeah, they're, they're really terrible. Um, the bondage of decay, but we will be set free from that into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with the labor pains until now. Romans 8. We, we look at the world and it's beautiful, no question about it. We see the Niagara Falls, it's gorgeous. We see Arches National Park, it's gorgeous. But keep in mind that everything that we see, as gorgeous as it is, is because of decay, right? Think about it, right? It's because of things falling apart. Imagine how amazing and beautiful it was when God made it to begin with, right? When made it uh, incredible. So uh, imagine, um, oh, uh, let's see. Imagine that you're building a house. So Gang and Hua, where's Gang and Hua? Over here. Gang and Hua have gotten into the, uh, the home network business, right? They are into, uh, fixer uppers, uh, the fixer upper business. Uh, how's that going, by the way? I, I enjoy watching your videos and watching you suffer. It's too much uh, work. Yeah. <laughs> so he's in the fixer upper business. So imagine, right, when when they built that house that you bought and you're you're fixing up. Uh, I don't think they really thought, hey, in 70 years, someone's going to be coming in here and ripping everything out that I put all this hard work into, right? Unfortunately, everything that you're doing to this house in 50, 60, 20, who knows how many years, somebody's gonna come in and rip it out, right? Which is unfortunate. It's like, wow, we put all this effort into it. It's because even the earth is decaying. My house is decaying. We just had to put new, new siding on. Siding lasts for what, 20 years at best, right? Or or until the next hailstorm. Um, the person that, that built our house is not uh, expecting those things to go. But here's the thing, Gang is gonna make that thing sparkle. It's gonna be amazing. He's gonna make a ton of money on it. It's gonna be great, right? Or are you gonna live in it? Give it to your son, right? Emmanuel's like a new place? Um, I don't know. Uh, it'll have modern plumbing. It'll probably have great garbage disposal. It'll probably have new flooring and Wi-Fi. It's gonna be amazing, a new version of it. And this is my second point, that God not only gives us new bodies, but he's going to make a new earth. Just like Gang is remaking this house, God is going to be remaking the earth. The same, but better. Um, no longer decaying. It's not just a New Testament idea that we see in Revelation. We see this 
uh, in Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah says in Isaiah 65, For I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. So what does it look like, this new earth? Ezekiel 36, 5 states this, uh, And they will say, The land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. It's all going to be brand new, like spring grass, like new you know, leaves on the trees. It's going to be brilliant, a brilliant blue sky. Uh, today is going to feel like downright gloomy compared to what a single day in heaven will be. Uh, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Uh, the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22, says this. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, crystal, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. This tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nation. And I bring that up because I want to ask you, does that sound familiar at all? Let me go over those elements of that verse again. Uh, number one, there's a tree, a tree of life, a life-giving tree. Number two, there's a river. Number three, there's fruit that you can eat. Does this sound familiar to you? Because the last, uh, the last book of, of, of the Bible in Revelation is a mirror to the first book of the Bible in Genesis. It's all in the Garden of Eden, except God is remaking it He's making all things new, making all things better. Um, restoring things back to their original plan of perfection, except making it better. Because it is no longer a garden, it has now become a city. So that's our next point, that God is making uh, heaven in, uh, a city for us. Now we all like a good garden, but nobody likes to live there, right? We. Uh, we love a great home. Uh, Adam and Eve started in the garden, but heaven will be a heavenly city, a home. Hebrews 11:16 says, But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Revelation 21:10 says this, He carried me away in the spirit to a, high, a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a precious jewel, like Jasper's stone, clear as crystal. Now we love to go to cities. Um, my daughter just got a, an opportunity to go to the great, two great cities in America uh, at the end of her eighth grade. So it'll be like next year. It's super expensive, so we don't know if she's gonna go. But, um, <laughs> to Washington DC and then they travel by bus to New York City um, so I don't know if y'all want to donate to her uh, eighth grade graduation fund then let me know uh, <laughs> so amazing experience of these two great cities they're gonna go to the uh, uh, the towers they're gonna go to a Broadway show and go see the lights on on Times Square they're gonna go to see all the Washington DC stuff it's gonna be amazing but I'll tell you, whatever amazing thing she sees in those two cities will be absolutely nothing compared to heaven. Absolutely nothing. Listen to this. Revelation 21, 16. The city <laughs> is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with the rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. So we talked about this at the funeral before. But, but how much is this? How big is a stadia. A single stadia or one stadia is 607 feet. Doing the math, 12,000 stadia then becomes 1,380 miles. How many people went to Standing Stones last year? Pretty long trip, right? Like, man, that's the worst part about that whole thing is like getting down there, it takes 14 hours or so uh, of pretty much continuous driving. Uh, from here to Standing Stones in Jackson, Tennessee is 820 miles approximately from our house, okay? Heaven 
the city, the singular city of heaven is 1,320 feet. In other words, add an additional 560 miles on top of that. Basically, the drive uh, from here to Houston, Texas, and a few miles further out into the sea will get you the single length of the, uh, the length of the city of heaven. Compared to uh, the continental United States, the city of heaven just on a horizontal level would be 60% of the United States. Um, New York City, the entirety of New York City, the greatest city arguably on the planet would be 0.01% of what heaven would be like in terms of size. Because, um, because also remember that heaven is not just horizontal, it's vertical. When you go to New York, one of the things you'll, you'll notice is the skyscrapers. They're huge, they're amazing. And you'll, you'll st stand on one side and look at the skyscrapers completely covering over uh, the banks. But those are hardly anything. They're, not a single one is a mile high, right? And here heaven is uh, vertically just the same height as it is length and width. Um, Going to the highest, uh, the penthouse of the highest building in New York, you can see the whole city. But imagine going to the highest point in heaven, how, how far you can see there. So the cities are beautiful places, but they're also dangerous places. Um, we're equally, like, we, we went to this meeting about, hey, let's get all these eighth graders to New York City. And the first question, of course, by parents was safety. And of course they say, oh, safety is our top concern. You know, we want to keep our kids safe. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that big, the bigger the city, the more opportunity for danger. Um, we're not afraid of the bright lights or the daytime, but at, at night when it's dark, the city is, brings the, out the worst of humanity. Uh, now, I wouldn't want to be walking around South Minneapolis at night where I work, um, or North Minneapolis for that matter, where I used to work. Um, but, I mean, that's just Minneapolis. You compare that to New York City. Heaven, however, one of the benefits of being in this city is that it will be 100% completely safe. It is no longer, it no longer has the curse of sin on it. Uh, Revelation 22, 3 and 4. There, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. In other words, it will be ruled perfectly and it will be... Uh, uh, the citizens there will live perfectly. In heaven, uh, it's heaven because God's throne is there where he lives and will be perfectly safe. A um, couple more ideas. Third, heaven will have a new body, will have live in a new city, but it will also be our final home, our final home. In most funerals, you've heard John 14. In fact, Chadsey read it at um, uh, the other day. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus says this in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. When you go on vacation, uh, you come back, right? And say, Pastor, you got to go to this place. The hotel is amazing. The rooms you stayed in were beautiful. Because as much as the city is beautiful, as much as the garden is beautiful, it's where your home is, or where you'll be sleeping, where you'll be residing, where you're living. It's going to be amazing. Well, the hotel room that Jesus is making for us, the home he's making for us, he's been preparing for 2,000 years. <laughs> Think about that, right? God made the world in six days, and Jesus has been working on your home for 2,000 years. I love that idea. It says, I go to prepare a place for you. In your home, what do you do in your home? Right? You eat. Will we eat in heaven? Yes. Everyone say amen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> do you know that the word feasting is mentioned in the Bible 400 times? Uh, it's one of the most used words in the Bible. What did Jesus say in Matthew 8, 11? I tell you that many will come from the east and the west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. 
Heaven is oftentimes pictured, you'll see, as a giant banquet table. It's endless. Uh, I don't, I, you never see Asian food on it. Some Asian artist needs to figure that one out. Okay. One of the greatest pleasures of life is eating. Jesus comes back from the dead. What's the first thing he does, right? Aside from meeting his disciples in the upper room. He goes to Galilee. He says to his disciples, right? Come out from fishing. Come sit and have breakfast with me. He eats a meal with his disciples. I, I believe that that breakfast, right, is representative of the type of breakfast we're going to have with God in heaven. It's going to be incredible. All your favorite stuff, right? Um, not just the, the food, but the fellowship uh, with God around the meal. What else do you do in your home? You sleep. Will there be rest in heaven? Yes. Yes, maybe yes. Let me explain. <laughs> so, we will already be at perfect rest. Uh, if there are beds in heaven, it won't be, be because we're tired. It will be because napping is enjoyable, right? Or recreational. Um, <clears throat> recreational napping. As I grow older, I have more trouble sleeping. Right? It's, it's the whole get up for work, I'm so tired because I've been preaching the day before. <laughs> I'm so tired. Let me grab a cup of coffee, which keeps me up that night. Uh, and uh, I'm so tired, then the next morning, oh man, I gotta get, get a cup of coffee. So I get in this horrible cycle of having not to sleep. But heaven, we will be at perfect rest. Here on earth, uh, we just gotta be disciplined around our coffee intake. But in heavy, heaven, will be a perfect rest. Um, rest, in fact, is one of the major themes of the Bible. And even the word Jerusalem means um, peace, right? City of peace. And we'll be at peace, we'll be at rest. Um, how will we worship? We know that in, in heaven that the angels will be around the, the throne saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they'll be repeating that over and over and over again. What will our worship look like in heaven? Will we be doing that? Well, imagine you're tra traversing the universe and you see the most amazing things. Flowers, these impossible meals that you'll eat. Uh, and we'll be like, God, you're amazing. You're so amazing. And that's what worship will be like as we enjoy his creation and we enjoy God himself. That is a for our form of worship. Um, I'm sure we'll have music, but guitars will not be necessary. Chris uh, will... Chris, his, his role in leading worship for us will be important, but uh, we'll be able to worship wherever we are. There won't be a need for it. Will we be bored in heaven? My question is, are you crazy? Of course we'll not be bored in heaven. The universe is ever expanding, right? Even non-believers know that the universe is ever expanding. Uh, Non-Christians will say uh, it's, it's endlessly expanding. If it's endlessly expanding, it will be endlessly explorable. Um, our sun is one, one star in the Milky Way. How many stars do we have in our galaxy, the Milky Way? You see, approximately 200 million. How many galaxies do we have on record? Approximately 200 million. So I don't know what, the stat, the, what that is, but it sounds like a multiplication fact to me, right? Uh, we will know more, we will discover more, we will be ever more impressed and uh, elated and excited about God and His uh, creation as we explore the world. Um, how about Simba? Simba, will Simba be in heaven? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bad dog, not in heaven. Right, no. Um, well, <laughs> unfortunately, there's one verse that says that the dogs and the uh, will be outside the gates of heaven, but then it says the dogs and uh, the those who hate God. And it basically, I don't think it, it's in reference to actual dog dog. I believe, however, that uh, you ask any kid what's what's important in life, and they'll say my Mickey plush, my teddy bear, right? Any little kid. Uh, something huggable, something enjoyable. So yes, I believe that when God created the earth, right, he filled it with animals, 
and in the same new earth it will be filled as well and we'll be able to do the same thing that Adam was expected to do which is to care for for creation care for creation in the earth, new earth as well so pet Tyrannosaurus Rex heck yeah I'm gonna have one of those <laughs> crocodiles or whatever uh, sure the Garden of Eden was full and we had the task of he had the task of overseeing them and so will we even Jesus was born among animals. Revelation uh, tells us, and is uh, reflecting with Isaiah 11.6, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. So, there will probably be animals in heaven. The last thing, relationships. Jesus said that there will not be marriage in heaven. Well, Pastor, my, my wife is my best friend. We love each other. I mean, won't we still be married in heaven? Um, we'll still have best friends in heaven. Your wife will still be your best friend in heaven, okay? But you'll also have billions of other best friends in heaven. So, you will, Jesus says you will not be given to marriage, um, but you'll be essentially married to Jesus, okay? Which sounds like a weird thing. Like, what does that mean? But... Or, but we will, our, our, our relationship, our married relationship will be with Christ. Um, on the earth, you can only handle one or two best friends, right? Maybe if you die with a handful of best friends, you die as a, a rich and wealthy man, right? Or woman, that you have those, those friendships. But in heaven, we'll have billions. Uh, Revelation 21, 27. Nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false will enter heaven. In other words, we'll be around people we can trust. The reason why we, we don't have, you know, hundreds of friends uh, is because people hurt us and we have to part ways sometimes, right? Uh, and we, but in heaven, that won't happen. We'll be perfectly uh, in perfect relationships with others as well. Where you can trust everybody. We just want to close with that, and I hope that that's been a hopeful and encouraging message for you to rem to think about the promise that God has for us. Uh, is heaven real? Well, if you believe the Bible, it's hard for us to to think. Uh, yeah, it's just an analogy. <laughs> clearly, clearly the Bible says it's real. Real. Clearly, Jesus is preparing a real place for us called heaven. And so I hope that that's something that we put in our hearts and set in our hearts as something to not just aspire for, I guess, but uh, more to hope for and look forward to. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for a very simple message today, a message of uh, reminding us that we are heaven bound when we put our faith in you. It's not complicated, that's just quite simple, Lord, that you've You've gone, prepared a place for us, and it's going to be far, far beyond our wildest imaginations. Uh, God, help us to trust you, love you, and look forward to what you have for us, not only here on earth, but beyond the grave, uh, for eternity in heaven. And we thank you. We pray for a wonderful time of fellowship today. In Jesus' name, amen.